yeah, a bit of back of my background because after all, I'm basically I have a mainstream research career. Basically, I have a mainstream research career, and um, as you have noted, um, I'm a professor at university. I'm um, I have studied computer science. I've PhD in robotics and computer vision, so I'm very much socialized in this mainstream worldview and. Um, Probably many of my colleagues don't even know uh, what strange things I'm doing in my spare time. So that's something which, of course, is also for me important to keep in mind. Um, how do these yeah, spiritual things fit into the mainstream worldview and how to yeah, live, live on both sides of research? And actually, two weeks ago, I should mention that I had a discussion with the chancellor of our university, which was kind of funny, there was an internal evaluation commission about uh, what the professors are doing in regard to research. And he said something like uh, the evaluation commission raised their eyebrows regarding what I was doing. And obviously that wasn't referring to the things I, um, I mentioned here, but uh, it was referring to recent papers and um, those, those strange papers or in, in the area where of course mainstream science um, yeah, has, uh, yeah, it's, it's getting worried that I'm going crazy or something like that. So um, I had a bit of discussion with him and um, basically I said quite relaxed uh, research, if the quality of research doesn't depend on, on the topic or the theme you're looking at the subject, but only on the method. And so I could basically say if you, if you are, have the opinion that I'm methodologically doing something wrong, then just tell me. But of course, he didn't even read my papers, so I was kind <laughs> of relaxed. And it was funny because there was also an HR woman participating in that meeting. And when I was saying this, yeah, well, the method is the only thing that counts. She was kind of nodding automatically <laughs> while the chancellor wasn't still, uh, um, not entirely happy with, with what I'm, I'm doing in this spiritual area. So I, um, I got into this whole topic of you know, or being interested in spirituality for quite some time. Uh, ten years ago, I wrote this book, which you can see there, which uh, but is, is only available in German. So, um, so I'm into this topic. But the biggest thing actually was when I got to know um, physical mediumship, and that was really a challenge also for my uh, yeah, for for my worldview and for everything. And I think uh, most people uh, know what I'm talking about who know physical mediumship that it's really a big challenge um, to digest what's going on there. And I got in touch with that topic um, when I met Lucius Wertmüller from Basel Tier Associa Association, the president who yeah, unfortunately died last year. And it's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's really a tragedy that he, he died so early and so surprisingly. Um, and he uh, introduced me to the topic, uh, me and my wife, and we got interested. And he said, "Why? Why don't you visit a uh, seance?" And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, now about eight years later, I've attended so many seances. And initially, I was of course skeptical, like everybody else, what's going on there in the dark and what does it mean. But the more I got to know the mediums and what and, and the soul seance phenomena, I'm now pretty sure that there's something into it. It's um, the, conventional explanation that it's just fraud or trickery that's it's just it's not not a good hypothesis from a scientific point of view because there are so many reasons that we have to take these uh, phenomena seriously and I will show some of the reasons later <laughs> so um, yeah here's also a picture um, I also had the chance uh, to participate in the famous Ibiza meetings where uh, some of the meetings met privately invited by Han Shea and also yeah more opportunities to really get in touch with the mediums outside the uh, public seances and to know them personally. And Inge also mentioned um, that I had the chance to do some investigations with different mediums. Actually, Kai Mügge is now the last one. <laughs> we started doing very interesting experiments um, uh, last summer and uh, about that, I cannot tell you too much, um, but about the Gary Mannion and the Wong Kayla uh, um, experiments, I will tell you some, yeah, show you some detailed results. And another thing I'd like to put in front before going into uh, the details, this whole topic of cognitive dissonance, because when talking about research in that area, of course, many 
researchers shy away and say that's nonsense and it, it can't be. And um, I think it's important to be aware also psychologically what's going on there because, um, yeah, it's all about cognitive dissonance in a way. We see or we experience phenomena in the in the seance which are hard to to fit into everything else we are taught uh, told about the world and of course there's one strategy how humans typically cope with cognitive dissonance namely by just in, ignoring the information or or just yeah avoiding to have another look at it and so we should keep that in mind when talking about physical mediumship we have to deal with cognitive dissonance we have to um, yeah, we have to have ambiguity, tolerance to just live with, the, with, the, with so many things we cannot explain. And I also cannot explain what I'm experiencing there, but I can have a look at the phenomena and try to get hold of them. And so getting into the topic, um, another factor is also that part psychology is very much is investigating that for quite some time, obviously, but it's. I think there's a very strong focus always on finding the ultimate evidence to convince people that the phenomena are real. And from my perspective, that's also probably not the best strategy because um, I think there are so many there are so many data out there which cannot be denied. But on the other hand, the skeptics will never be convinced, and that's again the topic of cognitive dissonance. You can bring as many arguments as possible. If People, if it just simply doesn't fit into your belief system, you won't accept uh, the data. So from that perspective, I, I said, and I wrote a little arti um, article, that maybe it's good to have a somewhat broader approach to this whole topic. And um, seven reasons to research physical mediumship, even if they think it's all nonsense. So many people think it's nonsense, but still they should accept that there are other reasons. If, even if you think it's all trickery and fraud, then you should be uh, you should uh, ask the question, how can it be that for more than 100 years this phenomena occur, that people are convinced that there are some tools in it, that intelligent, uh, very conscious people are convinced um, it's uh, something is going on there, then you should explain that if you think it's all fraud and trickery. Well, why do different mediums have the same phenomena throughout the world? There are so many... Um, facets of it which still deserve, deserve a closer look. And there are some other facts I, or aspects I mentioned here, I won't, won't go into detail. It's all about consciousness, obviously, so we can learn lots about um, how does consciousness affect our, yeah, how we experience the world, how do, for example, in the seance, the, the consciousness of the sitter, the experiences and so on, or the, the expectations they have, can have a strong impact on the phenomena. What does it mean? How, how can that be explained? So there are many facets. And um, yeah, maybe the fourth item, we see a lot how belief systems drive controversies. You will see that also I have two slides on how my um, articles I, I submitted for publications, how the reaction of the reviewers were. And it's, it's quite apparent then that the reviewers didn't argument the scientific reasons, but with belief system reasons. That can be quite clear, and I can show some examples on that in later slides. So there's many into it, many things into it, not just uh, is it true or is it not, or is it uh, find the ultimate evidence. I think I have found very good evidence, but the ultimate evidence, as I said, which convinces everyone probably doesn't exist as long as human, humans are very much driven by their belief systems. So to the um, to the experiments here, maybe one one final thing again regarding the parapsychological approach and this focus on evidence and there are other researchers, um, for example, perhaps uh, there are some parapsychologists who, who say, okay, we need ultimate control. We have to put infrared camera in, in every corner of the seance room. We have to strip search the medium. We have to have always the same conditions. Please, no more sitters in the room than only the parapsychologists. And uh, yeah, what I want to show with this slide, maybe you destroy the phenomena by imposing too much control on it. And I think we have uh, to be quite careful uh, when yeah, entering the seance room. After all, it's also not possible to simply switch on the light to see what's going on. But that's not the proof that the phenomena do not exist, but it just shows 
that the phenomena are very sensitive to the environment and it's also all part of psychological uh, wisdom. The more measurements you do, the less probably um, the less strong the phenomena are. So from that perspective, I had a very yeah, careful approach. So I didn't um, want to sort of come, even though I have lots of ideas with sensors and technology, what could be done. Um, for me, it was always clear, okay, the medium has to feel safe and uh, has to agree, obviously, uh, with what we are doing. And so um, to start with Warren Kaler, um, who was one of the mediums I got to know first in, in Basel, with, uh, also with the support of Lutzus Wertmüller. And so I attended there several seances. And one of the um, very impressive phenomena is that there are those independent voices, so voices moving towards the seance room while Warren is sitting in the cabinet, tied to his chair, also with uh, a tape on his mouth. And then you hear those different voices. And so one idea was, um, it's from, from a perception, it seems that the voices move throughout the room. They are like, yeah, really independent voices moving independently, freely in the room. But it would be nice to measure, measure that because in the dark, our human senses can be betrayed or can uh, we cannot be sure. Um, so the idea was, yeah, I can measure that. I could form, I have put four microphones at the wall. I wrote some software which uses the time differences with which the sound arrives at the microphones to localize as a position of the sound source in the room. So it's, it's some triangulation technology, some yeah, audio processing technology. And here we see some of the results. So we see the audio events in the seance room. We see the sitters here in this uh, 3D illustration. And we see, of course, uh, the sitters talking, chatting. Uh, at the lower left side, there um, is a, a circle leader, Lucius, and, and Sabine, his wife, um, who obviously were also talking a bit more. And yeah, then you see that actually there are voices or sound sources outside the cabinet. And if you have a closer look at that, um, we can see here four different voices indicated by the different colors um, corresponding to the different um, trans personalities of Ron, like Luther and um, Tommy and uh, Winston and uh, Yellow Feather. I think these four were in this case. And you see they are coming from even from different heights. What's already quite interesting is there's this um, uh, spirit personality, Tommy, which uh, is according to what he is telling about himself as a child of 10 years age. And he is really coming from, from a lower position in the room, which is kind of, I wouldn't have expected that that, that really correspond, corresponds to the, um, yeah, to the fact that it's a child with, um, which is talking there. And yeah, what else do we have? I, 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 there's a video, but um, I think uh, probably it won't be transmitted anyhow too well here via Zoom. You can watch uh, also the, those data and the videos on my website. Um, here's another example. There's a special sound when the extoplasm is um, yeah, moving through the room or when, when the phenomena ends and there's some noise which um, it's said that it's when the ectoplasm is entering or moving back into the body of the medium. And I could also show them those motions, even though they happen in the dark, because the sound source is moving as well when this happens. So we see really something like this curve um, when the ectoplasm or whatever this uh, sound uh, generates in that case is moving out uh, or moving back into the body. So. These are quite, from my perspective, I think quite interesting things. Another thing I, I did regarding the audio analysis was um, to analyze the profile of the spirit voices. And um, that's a technique used um, in speech analysis, also in forensic speech analysis, by having a look at the different so-called formants, so that are parts of the spectrum of the voice, which depend on the vocal tract. So um, there are other formants which, for example, if you say an O or an U, 
which shape the, the sound, sound of um, vowels and so on. But these um, higher formants are characteristic of the speaker. So you can use them sort of like a fingerprint, not that exactly, but like a biometric uh, um, measure of the speaker. And here we see the three um, trans personalities in Von Kaler's voice, and they are different and actually quite different. As a comparison, I used also a the voice of a comedian and how he uh, mimics a different voice, which also sounds quite uh, different. So he is, there are very nice audio books by this German comedian where he changes his voice and then um, yeah, speaks in an entirely different voice. But if we ha look, have a look at the formants, we see it's still the same voice. So th that's a strong indication that uh, Warren Kaler doesn't simply mimic his voice, but it's really a different voice with a different vocal tract which is, of course, also nice evidence regarding independent voices. So I thought that's uh, yet another thing which was also kind of uh, surprising to me when I had a look at this, uh, these formants of the Tommy voice, the children's um, child's voice. Um, I compared it to how these formants change uh, with age, because the younger you are, of course, uh, the vocal tract is smaller. And again, it, that was kind of surprising that it exactly fitted into this 10 years uh, age. Uh, the voice of Tommy fitted there. And it's hard to imagine that if um, Von Kaler mimicked all these voices by purpose, that he knew about the formants and that he had to fi uh, fit the formant F3 and F4, that it exactly fits a, a child's voice in that age. So that's also, for me, a, a, was a, you know, a nice surprise that even that seems to fit to the voice. So I thought this is actually quite some nice material. And now regarding the scientific part, so why don't, shouldn't I publish it? So I said, OK, there's a conference about audio and signal, acoustic signal processing. And they have an area where they say applications for signal audio signal processing, which is ex exactly what I did. I, I used audio uh, technologies, acoustic technologies in a special area of application, of course, an area of application which is not too well known. Um, but from that perspective, I said, okay, I submitted to this conference. And now what have the reviewers said? Basically, none of these uh, arguments from my point of view are scientific. One thing is, okay, they say, well, that's there's no novelty in this application, which certainly is not the case, because it's entirely novel that um, audio signal processing has been used in seances. So that's more like, um, so I wouldn't say it's minor originality. <laughs> and then there's this, this second item shows um, they try to find some minor problems. Why has the distance of the microphone changed? It's not really an issue. I mean, uh, I can explain it, but it's not what this paper is about, and it doesn't. Um, so, so they try to find some some things which don't really matter. This third item shows a kind of um, ridiculous circle because they say, okay, the fact that the medium accepted the measurements um, basically means the measurements do not are not valid because a medium who most likely is a fraud wouldn't accept measurements which uh, <laughs> would expose the fraud. So, but from that perspective, of course, any research in that area would be um, impossible because I can only do those measurements which are accepted by the medium. And to say then, okay, anyhow, these measurements are worse is just because they are accepted, of course, is entirely nonsense. And we should keep in mind, this, these are reviewers who uh, contribute to this famous scientific peer review process. <laughs> And the last one also again, just saying, okay, I don't want to like, I, I don't like this topic, please do something else. Of course, it's also not a scientific reason. So we see a bit how the scientific world um, works today. And um, yeah, but not surprisingly. This had a good end because the technical chair of the session, I submitted the paper to, um, to was actually quite interested. And he said, send it to a different paper. Um, I'm editor of a magazine, and I'm very happy to, to if you submit it to that one. And then, again, peer review, objective scientific process, entirely different results. <laughs> Here, the peer reviewer said something completely different. Um, 
And yeah, I liked very much. I, I won't read it in detail. Um, and I think you can have the slides or distribute the slides if you want to. So um, again, it shows how science is working today. It's very much driven by belief systems. We just have to accept that. Um, Inge mentioned I did some, some experiments in Michael Chain. Um, here, just one slide. We, we also used thermal video. It's, um, there weren't too many chances to do experiments with him. Um, so, yeah, just won't go into that more, even though I, I just have to say I'm also convinced that Michael Chain is a very, very good medium. And I have seen lots of things which are really surprising, like the supports and uh, ectoplasm and so on. So, yeah. From that perspective, for me, he's also very, very interesting. And then my uh, Gary Mannion, that's, yeah. Uh, thanks again to Inge for <laughs> introducing us to each other, to also inviting us to uh, Australia for having the first set of experiments. And there were many more to come. So um, yeah, uh, up to now we had 70 plus seances uh, in various test series at different places, Malaysia, Bridgewater, Heidelberg. Finally, yeah, get Gary, that's, that's our um, yeah, living room or dining room you see at the lower right corner. Finally, we had also Gary in our home. So of course, also from a parapsychological perspective, it's nice because um, I can be sure that he hadn't prepared our home for any tricks. <laughs> so when he was in our, uh, in our room, so um, even though that wasn't an issue for me because I knew also in the other rooms, there was no chance to prepare anything. Regarding the Gary experiments, Inge already mentioned this, uh, lots of gadgets. And because when we came to Australia, we had no idea what could be done. So I basically packed it all into the suitcase. Uh, I had some ideas what could be tried, some new things we could try, but of course the usual things like uh, camera, audio, thermal video, and so on. And the idea was to really negotiate with the spirit team what could be done step by step. And we had the chance to have two or even three seances per day, which were quite short, but so it was always discussion with Jimmy, the transpersonality, what can we do? Okay, next time we bring in these sensors, we do it uh, afterwards discussion, what are the results? Okay, great, let's go forward, let's try something different or oh, today is a bad day, we cannot do too much. So it was really like, uh, yeah, nice experimentation with the, with the spirit team. And of course, it's again something which from a scientific point of view, it's probably, yeah, raises the eyebrows. If I say, okay, we did in discussion with the spirit team, we did some nice experiments. Regarding the experiments, you see, especially those uh, little sensors on the upper right corner here, um, which were probably the most, maybe one of the most interesting parts in the experiments, I have to say. Um, also regarding the publication, the spirit teams uh, were those who decided when, uh, what can be published. And I'm still waiting and I, I said that to Inge, we had also some nice ectoplasm uh, photographs, uh, which are still not yet to be published. But uh, what could be published were the experiments with the uh, uh, motion sensors. And the idea is, or maybe first here, I have some slides regarding the different phenomena. So from the research perspective, probably the most evidential was uh, the movements of the cabinet um, while we control the medium with the motion sensors. But we, as I said, we also have nice ectoplasm um, photographs and we had meta through meta phenomena and so on and, and various uh, little interesting other things. Regarding the motion sensors, um, on the one hand, um, we had Gary tied to the chair at the beginning, you also loosely with some scarves later also with the uh, uh, yeah, usual cable ties. And, and so here we see one of the later setups um, arms and uh, wrists with the cable ties fixated uh, to the chair, but, uh, and I think that's even the stronger evidence motion sensors attached to his arms. Because the good thing about the motion sensor is it records permanently with 50 Hertz, 50 measurements per second, 
it continuously records any motion. So even if he would be able to remove his hands from the cable ties, the motion sensor would detect it because it would show some, some motion. And or if you would remove the motion sensor, we could see it because then there would be some motion detected. And if it's put on some entirely on the floor, for example, you see because the motion sensor does not move at all. Why when it's attached to the body, there are always very small, tiny motions because the body always moves somewhat. So we have a very sensitive instrument to detect any motion of the medium. And together with some other sensors, for example, I have a light sensor, which permanently records the light conditions in the room. Um, I yeah, sketched the whole proceeding of the different seances. And here we see an example at the upper, uh, yeah, the upper portion of the diagram, we see the different phases. So there's a timeline in minutes. Usually the seances lasted about half an hour or 20 minutes. We see the different phases, like Gary means, uh, the yellow um, bar means that Gary was still talking or visible to us, so he was present, he was not in trance, he was, uh, could be perceived by one way or another, either because he was talking to us or, or I could simply see him. We see when the cabinet was closed or open, so all, all that is with audio recording and, and the other sensors easily to be recorded and reproduced. We have the light conditions. I indicated when Jimmy, the trans personality, was speaking, and uh, we have the cabinet motion, which, which are the interesting phenomena in that case. And there are also, there's also video and still, uh, so video recording of it. And on the next slide, I show some still frames from the video. And you can also find that on my web page. And we see now the motion sensor, and that's the interesting thing. I don't, do you see, if I move the cursor, I don't know if you see that, probably not. If I move here my cursor, do you see it? Uh, mouse pointer? Uh, yes, we see, it. Yep. Okay, we see it. So here at the left-hand side, you see these strong motions. That's when the, the sensor is attached. So you see, um, then it's really like when, when I'm attaching it to the wrist, of, of, to Gary's wrist, apparently, okay, of course, there's lots of motion. But then basically you see no more motions. So that was, was a nice thing at the beginning. We had also the, the problem that when he started, falling into trance, that he kind of relaxed and uh, like moved a bit in the chair. Then of course we have some motions in the sensor, which is not nice because I wanted to have it calm throughout the whole seance. In that case, it's, that worked out quite nicely because almost no motions, only this, light, this, this minimal shivering. So that um, this also shows it's attached to, a, to him, he's still alive, <laughs> but it's not lying on the floor. But um, there's hardly any motion, and this is the orientation of the sensor. You, you can also see a big difference um, to, to when it's removed or attached or removed, yet it's removed. And then um, the interesting part comes here, the, the motions, the cabinet motions start, and the phenomena start, and still the, the sensor is almost entirely calm. Those, those are really minor motions. And they are related to that sometimes the cabinet uh, hit, hit his arm and it sort of gave, gave it a short uh, jolt or a short movement. Again, this is uh, almost nothing. And, and the, um, the orientation of the sensor throughout the whole time more or less remains the same. Also, that means that it, so if you have it like in a certain orientation, it maybe sh shifts a bit, but if you remove it, usually you won't be able to remove it in a way that it entirely maintains orientation and that the acceleration is so slow. So basically, when we can say throughout the whole experiment, Gary did not move. And then what could we see at the same time, we see the cabinet motions. Gary's specialty in a way is that his cabinet is often like this uh, shower tent. And yeah, that's what is going on. And in the video is even more impressive that there's lots of motion. Uh, when I try to remove the cabinet in the way, it takes some strength and some activity. We should remind, uh, keep in mind he's sitting on the chair. In this case, we, we were lucky because anyhow, even we have the motion sensors, we, even the cabinet moves away that we can see both his hands and his feet. And here, for example, here would be the motion sensor. And then there were some right to left shifts of the cabinet and still everything calm. So that's quite nice and impressive. Again, um, the video is on, on my webpage. I think it's, yeah, 
I, I would want shared here. And anyhow, I see the, my time. I'm already a bit over time at the say 30 minutes. So, but I'm moving towards the end. That's just another experiment. Um, in the previous experiment, we had two, uh, just one motion sensor. Now we have two motion sensors, both wrists. So even yeah, more control. Um, again, here this recording when there was red light, when was the light off, cabinet closed, um, cabinet removed, so the body is visible, um, trans personality speaking. So we also have a very nice recording of what was going on in the seance and get a good overview. Um, yeah, what was going on. Here we have some more activity, um, which again, uh, you see here orientation before and after. Is still the same. Here's some more activity, but if you see um, what's going on, there's again very, lots of activity here. And uh, when, the, for example, here at the end, the cabinet is entirely removed. Um, so while he's still sitting with his cable ties uh, attached to the chair, and both motion sensors um, show hardly any activity. And when it was removed, obviously, the, the, he himself was sort of shaking a bit because uh, of the cabinet activity but um, so yeah, that shows also a bit what how these motions look like and you see this is like like an arm moving the cabinet but again left wrist is controlled and you see no motion at all at the left wrist so exactly here cannot be an arm because it should be entirely calm as the motion indicates here we also have an sensor on the top so you see how strong these motions are for the sensor on the top which being shaken so that's already indicating indicated by such strong motions and if you listen carefully you hear Inge ex uh, with excited <laughs> sounds and <laughs> enthusiasm <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the best part is still to come. <laughs> Again, almost no motion here, left wrist entirely calm. I try to do that even without being tied to the chair inside the cabinet. And it's really hard to move with the cabinet, especially in the way you will see in, in a few seconds. So, best part still to come. Again, cabinet top, you see, and now the motions of the cabinet top are detected by the wrist calm. And now that's lots of activity. And still the wrist is quite calm, as you can see, compared to the cabinet top. Feet at the same position. So I would say that's quite nice, isn't it? And then there's one more. But that's the one we also saw the um, still image or something. Yeah. Also not too bad. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Okay, and then the one we also saw um, the data and have a look at his both hands. He's moving his uh, index finger. <laughs> <laughs> so very politely, but um, yeah, something like that. But probably that's hard to explain how the slow motion <laughs> can happen. That's a uh, slow motion to enjoy it even a bit more. Inge still loves it. <laughs> she likes you. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> you have seen that a hundred times or so. <laughs> it's still good, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so, yeah, there's one more. The, the final thing um, in uh, Bridgewater, we had also a very nice wooden cabinet, which uh, weighs 70 kilos, so quite heavy. And this turned as well. And uh, the nice thing is, again, we had a sensor on the top. It turns so smoothly. You can see that here, a bit small. It's like really with a continuous angular velocity, it turns very smoothly. Also, you see it here at the bottom, and then it stops. And also hard to imagine how, how this could be done, because if I'm trying to move it, I would like push and push and push. But it went very smoothly. 
So to finish it again, I think it's great science and it's evidence and it's interesting. So I submitted to the Journal of Scientific Exploration and it got rejected. And again, the, the uh, arguments are really all ridiculous, I have to say. I, I won't go into detail for all, but just uh, take the first one. Uh, he didn't use a camcorder. Okay, so what? I, uh, or he, he didn't use it enough. So that's what I said in the beginning. The, some psychologists think uh, you have to put four infrared cameras all the time in the room and otherwise it doesn't count. But it's, of course, it's stupid. This is evidence which we have seen. Then the motion sensors actually are quite cheap devices, but is it an issue? If they are not precise, it would be an issue. They say they are too cheap, which is, again, ridiculous. Um, so, yeah. So, and it goes on like that. It really shows um, uh, the bad side of science and of peer reviews today. Uh, and finally, yeah, do not invent largely useless electronic toys <laughs> that lead to misleading information and so on. It's really, uh, the, 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 yeah. Or do investigation with morally less burdened mediums and so on. It's really like, okay, we don't care about uh, um, argument. So there was actually not, not a single argument stating something like, okay, the sensor is not good or this evidence, or you have to t take a look at this diagram. So yeah, that's how also science works today. And that's even in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, which claim for them that they are really open to, to parapsychology. So yeah, but it doesn't matter. There are still people interested in it. The uh, detailed report I wrote is available for download on my web page it's many pages all the details all the science stuff and okay i mentioned kai Mügge. um i did some um computer generated imagery for him for quite some time because it's just to show what's going on this in the seances which if it cannot be photographed it's nice to create some images and to show how i saw it and other sitters say okay i saw the same most interesting, probably this full materialization we could experience. Really exciting. Other sitters do images themselves and they say, okay, I saw the same. So that's also kind of evidential, even if we don't have a picture. If four people say, I, I saw the same, it's evidential. And the final, final picture for today, um, this is our current investigation. That's Kai here is kind of making the secret out of it, uh, what we are doing, and he wants to time the publication by himself, which is fine with me. But I can tell you it's really exciting. And just yeah, a, few days, a few days before ago, we, we have been there again, and it was really nice stuff. <laughs> okay, so that's it for today. Thank you for your uh, interest. And of course, I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Oh my god, I get so excited every time I see it. <laughs> There's so much potential. There is so much potential to, to learn about it and, you know, to, to test it and it's fun. And what I really, really love about how you work is that you try to work with the spirit team and, you know, be very aware of what they say. Okay, we can produce that now. But uh, it also shows, I think, how, how much... Um, the medium's condition, the city's condition, uh, the environment, everything has something to do with it. And Jimmy would explain it and say, well, today we just can't. And how you always would just go with it. That was just, I loved it. It was just teamwork, both sides of the way. <laughs>